Good afternoon all to you, our dear esteemed viewers. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Community Show. My name is Douglas Drekonen. I am your moderator or host for this episode of the Community Show. This week, joining me is a panel of distinguished lady and gentlemen who will help us discuss land ownership dynamics in northern Uganda. So briefly, I'm going to introduce my panelists so that you can get to know them, but they'll also go ahead and introduce themselves so that you can understand who we are going to host today and who we shall be having the conversation with. I'm going to begin with this Mr. Uh, Mr. Col Colvin Odom from Nebi, Zombo District. He's a social worker, human rights activist. He works with Redeemer Children in Ajumani, in Ajumani District. He also formerly worked with refugees in Lamo District Palabek, uh, at Palabek Refugee Settlement bordering Kitgum and Gulu districts. Thank you very much, Mr. Colvin Odom, for taking time to join us to discuss this wonderful topic with us. Right next to Mr. Colvin Odom, we are joined by Mr. Openjuru Lada. Mr. Openjuru Lada is a, a former M M member of parliament aspirant in the year 2021 of Moya district. Thank you very much, Mr. Openjuru Lada, for taking time to join us in this conversation. Then the only lady on the show, uh, Ms. Anyango Angela Tadi. Uh, Ms. Anyango Angela Tadi will also go ahead and introduce themselves. She's a lady of many, many positions, of which I believe she will do us justice and introduce herself. So let me just begin with uh, Angela. Kindly unmute, turn on your video and microphone, and go ahead and introduce yourself. Most welcome. Um, thank Angela. you very much. Uh, my name is Anyango Angela Tadi. Uh, I got the privilege to get a university education, which is not common to say. Um, I was Minister for Gender and Women Affairs at Civil University, that was 2014 to 2015. Uh, I was also a youth councillor by the district, 2016, 2017. While at council, I mean 2016, 2021. While at council, I was also chairperson for finance planning and administration. Currently, I work for uh, Favor of God Ministries International. I'm in Gulu. I'm a women and gender activist. I, and I am so passionate about youth, women, and children. I'm pleased to be here at the end this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are pleased to have you here as well. Let's have Mr. Lada, and then we conclude with Mr. Colvin Odon. Then we can begin the conversation. Mr. Lada, you're most welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Openjurulada. I am a former a member of parliament, aspirant for organizations and the uh, 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 like um, Hands of Women Foundation, which deals in uh, in uh, skilling women for better livelihoods. I'm also involved in. Uh, indigenous knowledge uh, and work pro projects within Gulu University to ensure that um, our indigenous knowledge does not disappear or go away. So, yeah, that is who I am. And yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ladar. We're looking forward to having a wonderful discussion with you. Let's have Mr. Colvin. Uh, Mr. Colvin, you're most welcome. Yes, hello, everyone. I hope you are picking me. Yes, we can. Yes, um, Paul Binodongo, coming from uh, maybe, uh, which was, of course, formerly, but currently now, Congo. This is a man who is staying at the border of Congo, uh, comprising of Lendu and Kebo, and with a very good traverse of so many areas. But first of all, I'm very excited, uh, especially to Civic Space TV and the Center for Constitutional Governance, you know. I'm like celebrating 11 years of being engaged by Center for Constitutional Government right from Fort Carson. And I thank them so much that every year they have always been on my neck for so many other engagements. I'm a, a human rights activist and a social worker. And of course, having been working in Palabek Refugee Settlement in Labo District and currently now in Ajumani. Redeemer children. I'm so grateful to be with you all, panelists. And... Thank you. Uh, we are very grateful to be with you here as well. Let's just begin the conversation. Tonight we're talking about the land tenure system 
um, in, 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 in Acholi. And we all know that what has been going on in the region, a lot has happened or a lot is happening in regards to uh, the issues to do with APA, the issues to do with 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 the Balalo among others, but let's just quickly begin the conversation. I would like to begin with you, Mr. Lada. Um, as a former aspirant, I know politics is greatly interconnected with the dynamics of land ownership, apparently in northern Uganda. But take us up to speed. We are beginning the conversation with the land tenure systems in actually. So you'd maybe kindly take us through what are the different land tenure systems in the region, including customary, if that uh, customary, which I believe a uh, majority of the land in actually is customary, leasehold and freehold, and the applications. Mr. Lada, you're most welcome. So like um, uh, this area of Northern Uganda, like anywhere, anywhere else, we have all the land systems. We have um, customary land ownership. Um, we have... Um, there's customary land ownership, like anywhere else. We have uh, leasehold and freehold and uh, land tenure systems. However, most of the land is uh, owned in a customary in a customary sense, in the sense that uh, uh, land is owned by like a community of people. Like um, a family can say they own land, and if you go to most villages, most villages are attached to clans. Uh, for instance. Uh, personally, my clan is uh, Bobo, and if you go to an area called Bobo, you will find most of the people who are in that land or occupy that land are uh, from the same clan as I am, so I would call them my aunties and uncles, so they would be from, from the Bobo clan as well. So most times when the land around that area is owned that way, it's customary land and you see, even when you want to like uh, do anything, you have to first discuss with your family to tell them that, yes, I want to do A, B, and C on this land, and this is how much land I may need. And they'll be like, okay, fine, this is the land we have available for you. And that's how it, it works. And that, that's, that's how land is owned. It's customary owned. However, freehold and freehold land, and um, freehold land and uh, say, uh, leasehold is something that is coming up in the recent times. It is uh, it is coming up recently because uh, people have learned that land can be sold and uh, it can be a business that someone can do. So it is something that is happening and it's going on a lot and many people are selling land and it's ca causing a lot of conflict because most of the land is owned customer in a customary sense of way. So it makes selling land and the distribution of land a bit complicated because nobody in particular can say that this area is my land because you own that land with your clan, with your clan members and uh, clan people as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lada. That has been a very comprehensive discussion on the tenant systems in the region, particularly highlighting that the region greatly uh, runs on the principle of customary land ownership. And it's just of recent, wherein we have had uh, developments of people owning land in such as leasehold, freehold, among others. But let's just so quickly get the thoughts of the other panelists. Let me get to the lady, Miss Angela Anyango. What are your thoughts on the customary ownership in, uh, in, in Northern Uganda? Thank you for your yeah. guidance. Um... Basing on the Land Act of 1998, we have four different types of land ownership, which uh, today we have the least old, uh, free old, and then the customary plus milo old, which does not what? Uh, uh, is not applicable in Northern Uganda. We all know that. And um, majorly, as uh, the, 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 my, 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 my other co panelists said, we have uh, customary land which is uh, majorly practiced in Northern Uganda, much as we also have the least old and the free old, which are in play. Uh, now, there is customary land, which our grandfathers or forefathers hold closely to their hearts. But these days, because of monetize, monetization uh, of land, many have sold these lands. Um, we, 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 we have people who have come to buy land in our region 
we have we have uh, in investors, and you find that people are selling land. We have a family who have a big bust of land, but you find the decision is majorly made by the man in the house, and uh, sometimes this this are challenged. And majority of women do not challenge that because they feel men being the head of the family and for them being strangers, for them they feel they're strangers and by marriage they will come into the family but still they don't believe they can make decisions for their own homes. So this becomes a very big challenge uh, when, 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 when they sell off this land and they remain squatters in those land that they, they, they really own because children are there uh, in the end, you find we, they really need to use the land, but they cannot use it because they have sold it off. And uh, secondly, we have people who have bought land and it is titled in their names. But now, an event comes, uh, you, there is challenge of school fees. People are selling off their land because of school fees. The person will go study uh, and come up with a certificate in education. Um, work is not there. He has a family. He cannot sustain his family. He has already sold off his land. And yet there is other ways. They could have used this land, uh, planted in certain crops, cash crops that can be sold and money used for sustainability than selling land. Uh, we have people who have sold their land we have people who have bought lands and they're in their names. So such people, they start developing their land and you find the indigenous people who, who, who originally owned those land. They start, uh, they, 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 they now come and, and, and start fighting for that same land. Yet they have given it out to that person. So the red court injunction in the land and nothing can be done by the buyer Nothing can also be done by the owner, original owner of the land, which is really a very big dilemma in northern Uganda these days. A very few families are holding on. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Angela. That has been a comprehensive discussion as regards to the gender dynamics that play in and the poverty that is in the region that is greatly leading to um, a confusion on the land ownership. We find that a, a community that has greatly relied on co customary ownership, communal ownership of land, right now we are in a dynamic whereby poverty has caused a number of factors. But that's not a question that I would like to push to my brother, um, to my brother um, Colvin, Colvin or, or Odongo, um, to discuss the historical factors that have contributed to the current state of land ownership in Northern Uganda. Yeah, thank you so much once again. Good afternoon to all of you. Yes, we know that as regard to uh, these historical factors that have contributed to the uh, to the current state of land ownership in northern Uganda, we know how far we have come, especially to our uh, discussions who have just given up uh, out their views right now. I generally concur with them because we know that especially these uh, this issue of, by the time even uh, the article 237 uh, of the constitution, all land we know that in Uganda can be vested and is for the citizens of Uganda and shall be owned in accordance with the following land tenure system, which is customary land, leasehold, and freehold tenure system. And we know that uh, we just got ourselves where we are. Sometimes if you are not careful, you may even you may not even know where we have come from. Now, like uh, this part of uh, uh, maybe Zombo, we are living in a moment where we have come, some people have come from Congo and we just got ourselves here. Some came from uh, uh, South Sudan and we got ourselves here. Now, by the time, even before Gepir and Labong, they came with their disagreement in this very area of Akwaj whereby they separated because of their own grievances of the beats and the spear history, where some went to the other side of, um, of the neural land, and then some had to migrate and it came up in this side of Okoro. There were a lot of, let me say, land which was just vacant. And 
Again, uh, to just add in a few, when Idi Amin came in power, we know that he also just gave, you know, that mandate, people should just live as much as they can live in the area. And land was actually not having any moment whereby people are having a lot of grievances, fight, whatever. Even like uh, when, you know, like being someone who studied in the seminary throughout a major seminary in Gula Lokulum for all these years, and I am a little bit grown up and groomed in the, uh, in the system of the church. When the missionaries came, now they have even celebrated 110 years so far uh, in this very part of Northern Uganda, whereby they came uh, in 19, is it in 1911, when they stepped in, in Gulu. And they came this side of Nebi, and then they transversed up to the side of Arua, whereby they really brought a lot of uh, uh, like. So we find that our elders, the king, the cultural leaders, they were giving land, enough land for them to bring all this development of say school, hospital, uh, church to the people. There was nothing like uh, those kind of uh, uh, work coming. Now, what is now trying to bring issue these days, whereby now all these uh, historical factors which made us all to come here, whether it being like it was war or it was some of other factors like now witchcraft. Now let me say like here in Nebi or in Zombo, you find that there are some people who are culturally having all this mandate of owning the land. But because of some of the of the bad practices, like evil practices, you find they have been expelled from their customary land here. You find someone is being given like around 300 kilometers or 200 kilometers away from the customary land where they are staying. Someone goes now like for 30 or 40 years, and then life becomes a little bit hard there because you have produced children. Now you want to come back. You can no longer come and now begin to uh, say that I need my land where my grandfather, my father, or whatever you have been staying. So in, in regard to that, the only thing they can now do with the children is automatically war. Because you have been chased because of witchcraft, now you think people have forgotten about that. You come, you need your land, it is no longer there. Now, when you come to the issue of, let me say, freehold tenure system like here, uh, you know, with our very uh, cultural leaders and some of our clan leaders, sometimes influence of alcohol has been given that moment. You find an elder will just say, uh -uh, I'm going to give you the whole of that hill. You dig as much as you want. Remember, the population was still very small. The influence of alcohol, nothing like uh, putting any document of agreement. Now, here, children begin to come. Issues now begin to crop up in where I needed the land of my grandfathers. What do you do? The only thing you can do is only war. So the history is just too rich. If you are to really give now, like at the border here of Lendu and Kebu, these are all people who are staying next to the border of Uganda and the Congo, where I am also staying. There are a lot of athletics almost all the time because of historical factors. How have you got yourself here? For us, we came from Congo side in the area of Wara. Now for you, where you come from? You find now Kebu, Lendu, Aluru. There is a lot of issue there. So thank you. Briefly, I can first stop there. We shall continue in the different moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. That has been a very comprehensive discussion as well. L let me get back to you, um, Lada, on the issue now of land disputes. Having understood the kind of land tenure systems that we have in Acholi, which is majorly customary, that most of the panelists do agree with. And with the recent developments that all of you have noted, we have seen people traversing leasehold, trying out freehold, among others. But now I'm interested in us discussing disputes in the region, land disputes. Um, you are aware that we, we had the LRA, the Lowest Resistance Army Insurgency that occurred for a period of 20 years that so most of our, our, our family members, our community are uh, placed in IDP camps. Now being placed in IDP camps for 20 years distorts a lot in the social fabric because kids were born in camps 
um, the young generation now, most of them were in their twenties. Today, were given birth in camps, and most of them do not know their lands, or even do not know the boundaries of their lands. But Mr. Lada, the question to you is, what are the common causes of land disputes in Northern Uganda, such as the boundary conflicts that we're having, the land grabbing, and the impact of the Lord's Resistance Army? Mr. Lada, you're most welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll begin with the historical factor. Um, you see, I hope I'm clear. Um, in the past, uh, um, Northern Uganda had a war, and this war had been going on for a very long time. This war caused uh, the displacement of uh, several Ugandans, and uh, most of them, of course, like what happens during war, they had to run away from the places they called home to seek safety in different locations. Now, um, the end of the war was uncertain, but it's the courageous people that returned to their homes. And the return was in such a way that um, you would uh, look for traces of where you had buried some of your ancestors, your ancestors pre-war. Um, I will give an example of a place I am very familiar with, and that place would be Noya District. In Noya District, um, a person would be like, um, my grandfather was buried in such a location, and then they would uh, uh, you would find uh, people following the older uh, rail system to locate where possibly their grandparents would would have been uh, buried, uh, in such a way that they would look for uh, mid trade infrastructure, and then they would use that to trace where their possible land would be. Now this would come as a problem of um, say, I, Maxwell, or I, Lada, I would find a piece of land and say my ancestors were buried. This means uh, my, my land of this size is now mine. Now, when my uncles and other people come and they say, if you're saying that this land is yours, where is ours? Because we also are claiming the same land. Now, if two of us are claiming the same land, someone else can come and say, the person you buried there is not your ancestor. It is my ancestor. You're claiming a wrong ancestor. This is actually my land. So that is like causing the biggest uh, land disputes within the area. Those who, they return the people who are looking for traces of where their land used to be. And also those who are just claiming that that is their land, of which it's very difficult to tell because there is no documented evidence or had evidence to prove that you owned that land. So that, that is like one of the major, the biggest uh, causes of land disputes. Then the other thing that may be causing land disputes uh, in, the, in Northern Uganda would be the customary ownership of land, whereby um, uh, from what I've experienced uh, in areas like uh, Amuru, Amuro and uh, Pade is whereby um, where the head of the family passes on and then the one who comes in next is looking for financial gain and sells the land which is supposed to be inherited by maybe the children of the one who has passed on. So there is no, there is no clear understanding of who owns what land and uh, and what is the size of who owns what. So it makes it uh, complicated and a bit uh, confusing when another person wants to benefit of somebody else's uh, claim that they own this particular property or they own this particular piece of land. So those are like the two main causes of land disputes within the area. Somebody sells land without, the, without telling the family. And without telling the family, the, but the me who maybe who, have, who has bought that land, I will come and say, I own this land because so-and-so sold it to me. But the family will say, you cannot own this land because we do not know who you are. You do not own this land. And uh, that's what causes usually wrongos. So yeah, the, um, it, it, we can go deeper into that. It also brings in the question of the Balaro, but that would be added on later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nadai. You highlight two key factors, that one, the war, but then two, the, the tenure system that we have in the region. 
which is customary, are all contributing factors to the to the land disputes that we're facing today. Now, which makes me invite in Angela. Um, we're still discussing land disputes. I think my 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 brother that I mentioned the issue to do with Balalo, which I think it's important that we talk about them, uh, particularly in regards to the land grabbing that is happening in the region. So Angela, um, kindly come and give us uh, an in-depth discussion on the Balalo question, but also related maybe uh, that question will go to my brother uh, Colvin to discuss that power conflict. But to you, I am interested in you coming to put into con in context the question to do with the Balalo. You're most welcome. Okay, before I go into uh, the Balalo issues, uh, the land tenure system, which I feel uh, has caused most dispute in northern Uganda, is freehold. Why? Because I may claim a vast piece of land. Oh, apart from claiming, because I have money, I will go and buy and put it into my name because the land registration is in my name. I have the uh, I have all it takes to sell my land to the Balalos or to contract them to come and use my land for their cattle. So now, when the Balalo come into play, what happens and what is happening right now? Because they have, they have not started coming today. You guys come. And uh, the, 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 the small piece of land they have bought or they have con been contracted to use, they start uh, engaging into the community, socializing with people. You find that there are so many Balalos who have impregnated uh, uh, our indigenous uh, people and uh, they bear children. When these women bear children, it's very hard for these communities now to chase the Balalo away from their land because now issues of blood relationship has come in. That is what is causing dispute uh, in, 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 in such areas where the Balalos are. So you find with these uh, issues of intermarriages, they, are, they, they now leave that one place they have contracted them to use and now start uh, space where they are socialized in and the in-laws are now giving them land freely. Others will go to else You find uh, a, a community or a family has given them maybe an acre or two. Without knowing, uh, you you will find an acre become an acre. <laughs> so for them, they feel they have sold uh, a small piece of land, but the letter is showing a very big uh, area that they have sold to those people which now start bringing in conflict that no, I did not give you this big land, but I gave you uh, stretching from here to that tree, which is now a very big issue. Um, to add on more, uh, there is also politicization. You find that uh, because money is in a politicization and monetization of politics, I mean, of, of, of the land in Northern Uganda, people now want it for personal benefit. You find that because I am in this office, I can use my money or I can use my power as a political leader to influence this community to allow them to come in. At the end, the community is suffering and for you, you're developing because you have that, you, because you have the money, you have bought your land and you're developing your land. You don't care what the community is suffering uh, from the effect of the Balalo and, and entering entrance into their community or their family. Um, others I would like to talk about is uh, the fake land titles. Uh, sometimes uh, people with, with, the, with, the, with the monetary strength come to play with the people uh, in the community. They bring fake land documents and people believe in them because they feel they're ignorant. They are really ignorant. They are not educated on land issues. So whatever they feel is there in pen and, and, and uh, in, in black and white, they feel it is good. It is, it is what they need to work with. Because they are blinded by that. Um, this this granted land owners, and then also coming of investors. People have become squat. People are given very and for investors, with whom do not even include the locals into the work of the investment. And yet, investments should have come into a community to benefit the community. But you find even the people working 
with the investors are people from different communities, not benefiting the locals, which is really very sad. Then also corrupt land officials. Going back to fake documentations of land is the reason, uh, I mean, the fake, uh, I mean, the land, <laughs> I mean, not, not fake, they are very corrupt land officials uh, that once they are given money, they will work into your favor. Demeaning the very land owners that should have benefited from their land. So uh, there is quite a lot uh, in play. Uh, you find that when a case is taken into court, there is also delayed justice in court, which causes a lot. And you find there is court injunction placed on your land. You cannot farm, you cannot cultivate, you cannot develop your land, you cannot build, to mention but a few. Uh, I want to touch very little on what my brother uh, talked about uh, during the war. Uh, there, there were satellite camps that were put in places. But to me, these satellite camps should have been in every trading centers, which are close to the communities where people should have gone to resettle there. But there were very few satellite camps placed in, 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 uh, in different towns affected by uh, the LRA war. So you find now, when time for resettlement comes, those days, um, uh, what, we, what, what those people knew about uh, the boundaries of their land, those things are no longer there because they have taken, war, the war took long. You find the smaller trees had grown into bigger trees. You, the garden they used to cultivate have become bushes and very thick to, penet to penetrate through. Uh, the water bodies that the people used to maintain care of them. It became very hard for people to go back and resettle in the places they have been uh, before. You find walking, people now started perushing, penetrating into the land. So where they can stop is where they now get settled. So another person will now come, as my, I, as my counterpart said, another person will come, this was my land. This was my land and you cannot now what? start defending. That is the cause of this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Angela. That has been an in-depth discussion as regards to the conflict in regards to land grabbing that is happening in the region. Let me get to um, Colvin Odor, uh, particularly on the conflicts to do in APA. Give us an insight or let the viewers who are watching understand exactly what's going on, because I know your Zombo is not that far away from, from the APA land. My brother, you're most welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. You know the issue of uh, APA, not just maybe I stay in Zogu, but I have really stayed and I live in APA and I've really traversed there and I've seen what is happening. APA, when we are to talk about the issue of APA, we have to just bring the issue of Amoro or Ashul in general and in Made. Now, you know, people should really be so careful because I can say that if you are coming, let me say like from Ntungamo or Alfares Kabale, and then you want to come and touch the people who are really the victims of the area. You know, people should understand that they are surely with the, with the issue of the LRA, they still have the scar. It has never ended and it will never end. Up to now, even if you are to go, you'll find some people are having one part of the ear not appearing. The mouth is cut. Now, if this is the very person who has really been staying, and you know that truly, before I got myself into this horrible state, my grandfather was staying here. Just because now he's not educated, doesn't have maybe the voice to speak much, because you know he's not having anything financial which can put him or her at the helm of trying to uh, defend him or herself. So you find that now some people. Maybe someone who is just 30 years because of the political trends that the person has, the money. Now you want to come and solve the issue, leaving someone who has now stayed for 80 years that should not speak. I live in that area and I have passed, I have seen how vast the land of Papa is. The river is there truly, and the land is so virgin, very big. 
Now, I think the only issue of a far land conflict is because of demarcation. Who can come clearly and say, this one is the real demarcation of the land where the Mahdi, you are to be here, and surely yours is to be here, are not there. Because before all these issues are coming, where were people living? You mean that land was just like that? And remember, the war, the LRA, broke way back in 1985, those years there. Now, where, where some of us were even not there, but our grandfathers were there and some are still there. Many people vacated. They went and they were staying in a very big camp. By then, there was a very big camp in Pabo. Pabo Gulu, Pabo, Atiak, as they are heading to uh, South Sudan or Moya Jumani, call it. And there's a lot of mass graves in certain areas like before Atiak. Now you find that the issue here is the land is vast, all right, and very rich. We may find that there are some big people eh, whom we cannot mention their names right now, who are trying to fuel, eh, trying to put some few loyal people who can really go and speak on their behalf. For them, they're just dishing in something to make sure they are the ones who are going to fuel because maybe they were a, a promise certain things, they will get some benefits or maybe say ministry or some big jobs. Now, that's why the endless war is coming. The best people that are supposed to uh, to involve here, the cultural leaders who are also being underlooked. Can you imagine at this very moment? You are supposed to involve the cultural leaders, like in actually the road and the OP of Mali, who are supposed to first of all come and bring their own issues. You know, some of our youth find some were born in the camp. But as you are born in the camp, remember, you are going to stay with your parents, with your grandfathers, who are going to begin giving you some of the historical moments that how have we got ourselves here? Now, because of the land pressure, that people can no longer now stay in the camp. Now, like if you have to go to Gulu right now, uh, behind Radio Maria down there, you find there are so many people who are just converged in a certain small hut. Remember, these parents produced maybe around seven. The children are also there. Now, the grandchildren are there. Life has become very hard in that very small land. Now, where do we go? Now, the parent will tell you, do you know what? Our place is in a park, a place like this, like this. Now, showing you, now you find someone or some government officials will just go and begin to tease their away and do it. That's why we have so many people like some Baganda and some are from Western Uganda who are going with a lot of big trucks. First of all, they started by evading uh, the big trees, those traditional trees, which, which can really help a lot in it, a charcoal burning. That's why in Gulu, these days, it has now taken, if I can say, 10 years. If you're not careful, passing with you a charcoal all the way from, from a pan coming to advancing through Gulu, you a charcoal will never survive. So they norm, normally now take the other, other, route which is very far so that they don't enter through the town or a very deep night like around 2 a.m. So it is now engagement of the cultural leaders and these cultural leaders which will really tell the fact and the government will really understand and go by that. This issue of, you know, beginning to say, you know, some of these uh, factors come because of the death of the knowledgeable parents who can really give the real issue. Some, some of these elders died now you find even if now they die, people will never die all at the same time. And much as LRA issue came, there was also another one even before LRA, Alice Lakwena. Alice Lakwena herself also invaded area much as for her, she didn't really take much long like uh, the giant LRA. Now the population pressure which I am trying to talk about, whereby now these very Asholi people have really disappeared because no one will wish the mouth to be cut and the ears and the dead. They went, but they really knew where they came from. You see there. So the government or all, all other people who can just come and buy things should go slow with the issue of the upper land. They should involve the rightful stakeholders to really tell them the right history of upper land. But if people are just coming from another region, coming to, you know, solve the issue of upper land, where you there when their mouths were being cut or their ears. So the only thing is about 
the loyal uh, legislators or some of the few government officials will also go slow. We, if it was a balance, they should go slow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, I'm interested particularly in the point that we need to involve the indigenous people in the issue instead of involving third parties who are not aware of exactly what's on ground. That has been a very elaborate and very detailed submission. I'd like to get to Lada. Um, the conversation is now moving towards gender and land ownership. From my knowledge of, um, of, of Africa traditional society, the man has always been a dominant species in regards to land ownership. And I think in our communities, we still face that up to today that when it comes to land ownership, most rights or the majority of the rights are granted to the man. So Mr. Lada, help us understand, um, assess the role of gender in land ownership dynamics, including women's land rights, inheritance, and access to land. Uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, gender and, and the land issue, first of all, I would say this is where um, the, the laws of Uganda clash with the, the traditional cultural laws. When it comes to traditional cultural laws, uh, women are not supposed to own property per se. Yes, they can own property, but maybe has a sense of, of uh, the child is too young to come and claim ownership. But in culturally, a child is not supposed to, a woman is not supposed to own property and most times they are supposed to be under the protection um, of their husbands. So this, um, this comes in, a, this brings a lot of land issues in such a way that um, the Uganda law protects women and their ownership of property because in, in according to the Uganda law, anyone can own property as long as you are Ugandan. But now it brings in, it, it clashes with the culture which says a child cannot, oh, sorry, a woman cannot own property. So it causes a bit of land conflict in such a way that, um, say, a husband of woman is to pass on, he will have uh, maybe land of this much. So when he has land of this much and is to pass on, the land can go on to be inherited by the children, not the wife. But say he did not have a male child, he did not produce a male child. That um, that can end up causing conflict within the family because most times in the in the traditional setting, which which happens in most of uh, these uh, remote areas, um, the uncles, the brothers of the of the man or the was of the deceased, will be the one to take over the property. And usually, they take over the property. Usually, the, the, what happens is they take over the property without caring for the children of the one of the deceased, they will tend to distribute this land to their own children. So the women end up being disadvantaged and most times chased out of these communities and they end up um, in, in, in situations of disabilities. Uh, in my work in um, the organization Hands of Women Foundation, most of the single mothers whom we have trained and skilled are, are a product of this problem. They tend to run away from their villages because they are being chased out of their lands because their husbands died. And uh, even if they go and claim that they own this land because their husband died and they own this land, they have children. Usually, the the marriages in the village setting are not are not uh, documented like how you would go to church and you sign a paper or something, or or you know the traditional marriages is uh, you do it the traditional way. And usually there are no documents that are signed that you got so married so and so. So you cannot go to court and claim that this is my husband's land and uh, he passed on and I, I'm the wife, I've come to claim this land because there's no evidence that shows. So you tend to end up falling into the traditional system of which the traditional system does not favor women. And these women are usually kicked out, kicked off this property and just off this property. So that's what happens. The women are in a position of a disadvantage or in the sense of land ownership because of uh, the traditional laws that are set against the, the country laws, the country's laws that are there on when it comes to their ownership. So that's how it always appears that women are always in a situation of they want land, 
but they cannot have it because tradition does not allow them to, to own us on the land. And the children do not have the power and authority to fight against the uncles who have decided to take over this land from the deceased person. And that is what usually happens. Thank you. Um, that has been a wonderful discussion as regards to gender, gender roles and the land dynamics uh, that are happening right now in Northern Uganda. It's true that women have been greatly sidelined, but uh, with recent developments, however, we have seen some slight changes. Um, this then takes me to uh, still pose the same question to the lady on the panel on gender dynamics. What's your say? What's your take? I would say, I want to say women are respected culturally. And ownership of land majorly is on a woman. A man is there by name, much as he's the head of the family, culturally. Uh, in actually, always a land is associated to a woman with the name of a child. Uh, there's a saying in actually, Okang, meaning that there is land uh, that is uh, entailed for the mother of this child. And, 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 and by nature, uh, families used to be uh, polygamized. Pol 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 Allow me to use that. So the reason why uh, they say the mother to this child, the mother to this child, they, they fragmented the land uh, in that this woman is in charge of this one, another woman is in charge of that one with the name of her child. So literally the man has no claim that this land belongs to me, but is a sole, uh, is the major beneficiary of the land. And reason why uh, there used to be poly poly polygamy, uh, uh, talked too much about and, and, and hold, held so closely to their hearts of, 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 of our former, forefathers, of our forefathers, land uh, needed to be protected so much for sustainability purposes. These children, they, they, they needed a number of children, they needed uh, to enlarge the family uh, to, to, take, to, 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 to help them cultivate the land, uh, to bring about food security. They never, the, the, the families never lacked. They had granaries. And the man had no say on the harvest. Once uh, food, food, food is harvested, it is taken into the granary, and no man gave a command to open a granary. It is always a woman to say, to send a child that, please, go and open that granary and pick this bean and pick the peas and pick the sorghum in here. But uh, these days, it is totally very different. I would like to say, um, as my brother said, uh, things are changed. Uh, traditional marriages really hold uh, much value to a woman. Once a woman is married traditionally, a certificate is awarded for the traditional marriage. Maybe because due to laziness, they never went to sign in for their marriage uh, to, to, to be registered by URISB, uh, which is legally noticed uh, by laws in Uganda. We have uh, the two parties, the in-laws and the families of the girl always what? Sign to, to, to stay as witness that marriage occurred. So in an event that the husband to the woman uh, goes away or dies, the woman has a full authority to take over, what, to inherit whatever was left by the husband. The only uh, dilemma that one can get is when a family gets, uh, gets uh, only female children. You find the mother, uh, let me put a scenario where the wife has died, the man is left with his girls. The girls are married to different families. And uh, the man, later when the, the father passes on, the dilemma is now, who is going to stay home to take care of the inheritance of our father. That is now where you'll find the family is now outsourcing, like he said, uh, the, 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 the brother to the deceased, they will now come and say, uh, we can help with this. But uh, one thing which is not really very right 
uh, with culture, uh, they now tend to sideline the girls, the children of the deceased. And yet the children of the deceased can still say as administrator of their home, much as they are once married to their different families. And I would like to say, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the much education the women are now getting from div different CSOs and NGOs, uh, including the government entities, women have the right to learn. And the right to learn stretches from your family to the place where you're married to. So you can have uh, land where you're married and you can have land with your family. But another beauty with culture is that once a woman comes back home, she is fully accepted at their home and given a piece of land to stay in. The brothers do not chase her away. That is one thing I am applauding uh, the culture for, for, for it. Thank you. Um, that has been wonderful. And I think it's 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 only plausible that there are certain there are certain practices in actually culture that deserve applauding, like that that you've mentioned, that once a woman lives or when she is sent away from her husband's home, she can also have a fallback option of having be, being given a piece of land at their own home. Um, we're almost reaching the top of the hour of our conversation, but let me just bring in quickly my brother Corbin to help talk about um, the impact that this the land conflict is having having on the indigenous community, the land grabbing, the conflicts that are going on. How is this affecting the communities? Uh, you know, actually, Alur and Ilango, they more or less have the same piece of land, if I'm to just like uh, some few seconds, especially where the women have no role to, uh, to own land. It is true. Uh, when you take it on the gender issue, women are really being affected. The moment you are married, you are married. And for Alur and actually for Alur, Genesis has even been worse. The moment your husband dies, you automatically have to pack and leave the land. You just go back to your brothers. And the moment you also come back to your brothers, the only thing your brothers will do for you, you are, you know, you are treated like as if you are, I don't know, coming from which, which, uh, which planet. You are given a very small piece of land only to construct a small hut, not even a, not even like two or three rooms, a hut. And you find when you have nowhere to, to just, you know, put a very small garden for only green. Life is really hard, except now I only applaud and I thank that women have now come out these days. They are now the very custodians of the policy and so many involvement, even in the ministry, they are the ones which is no longer there. Thanks be to God for them. Now coming to what you have tried to bring about indigenous communities being affected. Yes, we know, we know very well that uh, land, my grandfather, my ancestral, our ancestral land, but someone has come from another region, now becomes the landlord of the area. If I'm to really see how people are really suffering in Shopir. Shopir is in the eastern side of uh, Gulu. You take a Moroto route. When you take Moroto, and then you, you go a little bit deep, and then you will know where Shopir is. I'm telling you, we have some big shots who have bought a lot of land there, 100 hectares. 50 hectares and above. The very indigenous are being affected in Shopir more than anything else. Now, not only Shopir, but in so many areas. So now these very indigenous people are being affected in a way that they cannot even have access to the area where they are supposed to, to pass. You find before you have been using this very route. Now this very big man, who maybe they have leased the land for, who has become now the land, yeah, now the landlord at that very moment, will add a fence, a very big chunk of area to the extent that even you, the indigenous people, even if you are to just go and only access the market, you cannot. You have to move some good kilometers in order to reach to the market, and yet it is just the very side where you have been living. So you find the very indigenous people uh, have become slaves to their very area where they are living. Now, in northern Uganda, we have been so generous to the extent that we have so many wild fruits. Where you, we have guavas, we have mangoes, avocados, 
and mention them especially in the part of Okoro where I am staying. They call it like food basket, supplying to all of Arua district, going up to Jumani, Moyo, even Kulu. They come here to our area. When you are to compare it, it is just like a Kabale. Very cool feeling and it, the food is just enough. Now you find these very um, uh, human beings who have just, you know, by the power that they have, okay, due to our own poverty, I, was, I can also blame ourselves. You find it now, the elders have also gone astray with the cultural norms, where the land was not actually being sold. But these days, because now the big elders also want to stay by the roadside, they sell a lot of land to, to whoever wants to buy. Now, the moment you sell, you become now the very, uh, you, find you are the one who is now not going to even have access. Now, these very fruits where we have been uh, living, picking them, even, uh, uh, even like uh, bananas, you can no longer access any. The man will just come and pay, especially we have this each affecting us here with some army men. This one, I cannot hide it and I cannot deny it. And there are some few government officials, there are some army men who are liaising with some great people, either in a, in a, more especially in the Western Uganda. 100 hectares, a place with so many virgin, rich fruits, you can no longer access and even pick. The moment you are got the only thing you are, the only thing they do with you is being jailed. I have seen so many youth suffering because of that, because they cannot, can no longer access. Now, destruction by the livestock. Now, like we are here talking about the issue of the Balalo, who have invaded so many land, especially in Amoru area, Lamo, in Rhino camp. They have gone as far as this area of Lendu and Kebo. Balalo here, they are not only the way people are thinking. They have traversed almost everywhere. You know, once someone is uh, dealing in this issue of the cattle rearing, it is not just a matter of cattle is only going to just eat the grass where the Cattle are supposed to look for water to drink. And once they are looking for this water, remember they have to move some good kilometers to access that very water. Now for you with your half hectares of land, now this one who is you know, having like over 20 hectares of land is just going to make you become slave over your own half hectares of land. You have just grown you a small maize in a piece of land but now these cows are just, these cattle are just going to pass through that um, very grand day. Colvin, yeah, thank you. Um, we have reached the top of the hour and I'll just quickly get to uh, um, Lada Maxwell to give us his concluding remarks as so his hand is up, then I'll get to you, Angela, then I'll conclude with you, Colvin. Um, Maxwell, your hand is up, please make your submission and give us your recommendations and concluding remarks. Um, concerning the of uh, land in northern Uganda, there are a lot of uh, complicated things, but we have to look back and uh, from history and uh, learn truly what land ownership meant and how land ownership was done. Then uh, the issue concerning the Valalo, uh, for, for that the Valalo have existed in northern Uganda for the longest time possible because uh, in some areas, um, I have discovered in some areas in northern Uganda, for, for instance, in some places, in some areas in Amuru, there are communities there whereby they, they have names from western Uganda, but they speak actually like indigenous people. That means these Valalos have been there for such a long time that even the, their ability to speak their local language are sort of like degraded. So they don't longer, they can only identify themselves as Balalo by name, but not by culture and way of life. So that one, we really need to understand how land is owned. We need to sit down as communities and look back at land ownership and the importance of land and how to use land. And if if this is not done well and done properly, the mistakes of central Uganda are going to affect us, whereby we shall reach a point of having to, to exhume our ancestors because we, do, we, we can no longer own the land that is there. Um, in central Uganda, in most areas, <clears throat> many people can no longer claim that this was my village because that place has been urbanized to a point whereby 
you cannot see that this was once a, um, a culturally owned place. So if we do not sit down and look back at our history, talk to our elders, talk to our leaders, talk to our cultural leaders, and understand the purpose and the greatness of land and the usefulness of land, the mistakes of central Uganda are going to affect northern Uganda. All right. Thank, Thank that's, you. That's yeah. yeah, let's also have your concluding remarks in just 30 seconds. Okay, my concluding remarks are we need to look to our elders to help us have a say because um, uh, politicians are always politicians going to always run for what benefits them. The elders uh, traverse borders in terms of leadership. If an elder, if a clan leader, a clan leader does not only lead a clan of a district, but an entire clan of whatever area it is. So we need to look more into our traditional leaders than the politicians, because the politicians only serve a particular area, while traditional leaders serve beyond borders. So let's look to our traditional leaders to have a voice for us and to also help us understand what is going on. Let's use our traditional leaders to talk to other traditional leaders to solve this issue of boundaries because that's also another big issue. And with these traditional leaders, we should forget this mindset of boundaries, of tribal boundaries, and uh, and the look at cultural integration and cultural uh, working together and association so that we can be a united community. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much for taking time and discussing with us as well. Let's listen in for Miss Angela in less than 30 seconds. Your concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as I conclude, men to the women out there, please know your rights and stand up for your rights with respect and humility. All right, thank you very much. That has been a wonderful submission. Let's conclude with uh, Colvin, 30 seconds. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, most especially to, to you, Drag Onen, and, the, and the, uh, the CD Speaks TV. Uh, more special, I am so happy. Now, what really we should do is government should avoid forceful land grabbing and for refugees. It is understandable. Our people are so keen. They can really share whatever thing they really need. That's why they, they were able to give a lot of land for ref, refugee settlement, like in Bidi Bidi camp, which is the largest refugee settlement, and also in Palabek Lamour. The only thing, and the very government or the NGOs to ensure when our people happen to now give this free land, why should they go ahead bringing other people from elsewhere to come and work? And yet, these are the very uh, the very indigenous who have given land for this refugee settlement, but now they have not even have access to work in their own land. So this kind of thing will really stop and. Which will really know that involvement of grassroots elders, cultural leaders, should, re, should be done basically not just handling only some few people to, uh, to do all those kind of things. So the moment we are dealing with all this and understanding, there is going to be no bloodshed anymore. But so long as government cannot involve the grassroots leaders, we shall never have any peace in that. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've seen in the comment section, Angela said we should stop selling land, but rather construct and then have it back. That I think it's very true. We also need to combat and fight poverty in our region. It's imperative to note that poverty is making people do or sell away very huge chunks of land cheaply. So we ought to fight poverty. We need to embrace agriculture because that is how we've always lived. Young people need to engage in agriculture rather than focusing on things that do not build them. Otherwise, thank you all for spending time. Angela Anyango, uh, Colvin Odongo, uh, Openjuru Maxwell Nada for taking time to join us in this conversation. My name is Douglas Draconen. I've been your host and moderator for tonight's conversation. We've been discussing land ownership and the dynamics in Northern Uganda. Otherwise, special thanks goes out to Center for Constitutional Governance and Pacific Space TV for this space. Thank you very much for taking your time. See you again, same time, same place. Bye-bye. Have a blessed week.